Welcome to the second lecture in our Politics and Culture of the Contemporary Middle East class. Um, I should say a few words to introduce myself. My name is uh, Shehel al Khasheb, and I'm a British Academy postdoctoral fellow uh, at Thames. Um, I was trained as an anthropologist at the University of Oxford. Um, I wrote a dissertation on the everyday practices of commercial film production in contemporary Egypt, uh, out of which I published a few articles and a book called Making Film in Egypt, which is coming out, uh, inshallah, fingers crossed, in January, if you're interested in reading more about my research. And currently, I'm working on a history and ethnography of the Egyptian Ministry of Culture, uh, which is obviously very relevant to what I'll have to say about culture in the coming weeks. So I wanted to start by um, going over the next five lectures very quickly, um, since they're all going to be on similar themes. Um, Today, we begin with an introduction to the concept of culture, uh, and how it's been thought about and applied in the Middle East. Next week, I'll be talking about culture and heritage, uh, and how the two notions have been intertwined throughout the history of heritage initiatives in the Middle East. Um, my third lecture will give you a very broad historical survey of audiovisual media in the Middle East, uh, with a focus on the history of cinema and television. My fourth lecture We'll survey the history of musical production and consumption, uh, focusing on case studies from Turkey and Iran. And uh, my fifth lecture will examine how social media are used in everyday life um, in Egypt, more specifically, which is where I work. My lectures will have a broadly historical and ethnographic approach uh, to complement the kind of political science approach used by Elizabeth uh, in her own lectures. It's historical on one hand because we will explore how cultural production in the Middle East changes over time and emerges in specific political, economic, and social circumstances. It's ethnographic on the other hand uh, because we will be reading many small-scale studies of specific communities and practices to give you a more concrete flavor of what culture means um, in the contemporary Middle East. Each lecture will also integrate some material that you won't necessarily find in your weekly readings, um, either because it's from my own research or because these materials aren't available in English. Um, and I'll flag this when it's relevant, but I think it's important to add unpublished material or non-English language material to these lectures just to complement what you'll be able to read. Today, um, I wanted to problematize the concept of culture and how one can approach it. Uh, I want you to get three things out of today's lecture. First, I want you to know that there are very many ways to conceptualize culture and many ways to approach it. Um, overall, I'll cover four approaches in this lecture. Uh, these aren't the only approaches to the concept of culture that you'll find, but um, you're most likely to encounter them in your readings. Um, so my initial goal is just to give you a kind of broad enough survey of different conceptions of culture to allow you to situate the term in the literature that you'll encounter this term. Second, I want you to know that the concept of culture is not the unique property of intellectuals working in Euro-American universities, right? No single discipline, no single group, no single geographical location holds the ultimate insight into what quote-unquote culture means, right? So it's best to approach the term by bearing in mind the historical context of its development and its application. The approaches that I'll present today should not be understood as different versions of the same essential notion of culture with a capital C, but as elaborations on common historical concerns emerging from different and yet connected worlds in Europe and the Middle East. Normally, uh, the way in which you would be taught a class on culture in the Middle East would be initially to delve into a number of Euro-American theories of culture, um, including the ones that I'll be presenting today and using Middle Eastern cases to see whether these theories apply or to what extent they allow us to understand the region better. Right? What I want to emphasize today is that the concept of culture has been theorized by scholars and intellectuals within the Middle East throughout the 20th century. So with each approach to culture that we'll explore today, I'll say a word about how it's developed and taken hold among some intellectuals within the region itself. Right? Third, I want you to know that culture is not just an abstract concept, um, but a concept with concrete consequences in practice. This is important to bear in mind because while the different definitions that I'll discuss today will seem quite abstract, um, they have had direct material effects, uh, and we'll be exploring some of these effects today and in coming weeks. Uh, for example, uh, the idea of culture has shaped how knowledge is produced about the Middle East. It has shaped so-called cultural institutions affiliated to different Middle Eastern nation states, uh, such as governmental museums, libraries, theaters, printing presses, radio and television broadcasting companies, and so on. 
And it still shapes what academics call popular culture, right? As you've read in Walter Armbrust's Mass Mediations uh, on your key readings list. So broadly, today's lecture will be organized into four sections corresponding to the four approaches to culture that I will cover. The first section overviews the debate about the distinction between culture and civilization. The second section overviews three classical schools in social anthropology um, and how they each approached uh, culture. These schools are functionalism, structural functionalism, and symbolic anthropology. Um, and the third section overviews the culture industry approach initially developed by Theodor Adorno and uh, Max Horkheimer. And the last section uh, explores the analysis of culture proposed by British cultural studies um, and how it has influenced scholarship in Middle Eastern cultural studies. All right, so on to our first approach to culture, which is the oldest and in some ways the most common one outside of academia. Um, this approach emerges from a long drawn debate about the distinction between culture and civilization. Uh, this debate mainly took place among German and French male thinkers uh, from the late 18th uh, to the early 20th century. And it is summarized in Andrew Sartori's article on your further readings list called uh, The Resonance of Culture. European philosophers have made way too many distinctions between culture and civilization to just summarize in a few minutes, uh, but there are two important positions that you should know about. One position is to consider both culture and civilization as part and parcel of the same process of human progress towards enlightenment, betterment, refinement. Um, the basic idea is that culture or civilization um, is what distinguishes humans from nature, and all humans are bound to become elevated by the same process of cultural civilization. And uh, all humans here, between quotation marks, means all those considered to be fully human by European philosophers at the time, which, of course, excluded inferior races according to the prevailing racial typologies in Europe. Um, and this is something which Middle Eastern intellectuals did contest at the time um, and modified these kinds of racial hierarchies in the 19th and 20th centuries. I can recommend some readings about this specific uh, issue if you're interested. Now, another position in debate is to equate culture with self-cultivation or personal refinement. In this view, uh, culture is the sum of knowledge, manners, and refined attitudes that the individual must acquire to belong in a civilized society. That is, a society that as a whole has become more knowledgeable, more polite, uh, more refined. The basic idea is that there's a certain amount of general knowledge, what uh, French people call a culture générale, um, that every respectable human being must possess to belong in civilized company, right? Uh, with the same caveat about what it means to be a respectable human being in Europe um, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, this knowledge doesn't just come to you because you're born in a certain civilization, uh, as in the first um, position, right? Uh, but it comes to you because you make an effort to cultivate yourself. In his article, uh, Sartori argues that this concept of culture spreads from a core intellectual debate in Europe to the peripheries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Now, superficially, I think he has a point, right? Uh, across the Middle East and elsewhere, uh, the notion of culture as self-cultivation, as general knowledge that all real intellectuals uh, should strive towards acquiring and nurturing is, is a very common one. Right? When Arabic-speaking uh, people talk about al-thaqafa, uh, which is the word equivalent to culture in Arabic, or when Persian-speaking people talk about farhang, uh, the Persian equivalent, the connotations of being knowledgeable, being civilized, being cultivated are never far away. Um, and the contemporary meaning of these terms did develop through an engagement with European debates about culture and civilization. However, uh, Sartori's argument, I think, falls short on two significant counts. Um, first, he doesn't engage with the non-European intellectual debates within which the notion of culture was embedded in the 20th century. To just give you one example, um, he doesn't mention that there's a very long tradition of thought about the concept of tamadun, right, which roughly translates as civilization, but connotes something more like urban gentility, refinement, cultivation. And this kind of concept has been used and debated in intellectual circles across West, Central, and South Asia, as well as North Africa over centuries, right? So the concept of culture didn't just come from Europe into an intellectual void. There were already debates happening among very similar notions. Right? Now, second, um, Sartori is interested in the kind of smallest common denominator among all non-European appropriations of culture, but he doesn't really address how these appropriations can significantly reshape the concept. 
For example, in the Arab world, um, there's a whole generation of male writers and scholars who thought through this idea of culture as self-cultivation from the 1920s onwards and in dialogue with European scholarship, but not always in perfect agreement with that scholarship. Um, and here I'm thinking about authors like Ahmed Amin and Taha Hussein in Egypt, or uh, Jamil Saliba in Syria, or Jawed Ali in Iraq. Um, and to just illustrate this process with one example out of very many, I wanted to show you this book. These are the proceedings of the first Arabic cultural conference in September 1947, uh, which was convened by the Cultural Committee of the League of Arab States. The League was founded in 1945 with the intent of strengthening international cooperation among Arab states, some of which had yet to gain full independence from British or French rule. Um, the six original member states were Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. And Yemen joined a few months later, and you can see their flags, the seven flags on the book cover. The conference was convened through the efforts of Ahmed Amin, uh, the head of the Cultural Committee, but also an important intellectual in Egypt since the 1920s, um, having been the founder of the very influential Literary Committee for Translation and Publication, and the editor-in-chief of a well-known literary magazine called, conveniently, al-Thaqafa, or culture. In his introduction to the proceedings, Ahmad Amin explains that the conference was convened to discuss some basic unifying standards in Arabic medium education across the Arab world. In a context where ideological conflict uh, brought Arab people apart, in his view, Amin devised an elitist solution, right, to bring cultured men together uh, to formulate a common curriculum in Arabic language, literature, geography, history, and what he called patriotic education, or al tarbiya al watani in Arabic, which is something closer to um, citizenship classes in the UK, for example. According to Amin, culture was equivalent to good education, which is something that's common in the European notions of self-cultivation as well. Um, but the content of culture itself was reshaped by the specific context of the conference. Right? The intellectuals in attendance, as well as Amin, uh, worked in emerging Arab nation states. Uh, remember that these states had only just become independent or on the cusp of becoming independent. And they wanted to establish Arabness and the Arabic language as an institutional priority in schools across the region. So this conference doesn't just show that there is an understanding of culture as self-cultivation that's become prevalent since the 1940s uh, across the Arab world, but also that it was adapted to the concerns and institutional practices of Middle Eastern intellectuals. Um, and in this case, uh, to the concerns of the Cultural Committee of the Arab League. So let's move to the second approach that we'll cover today, uh, which comes from classical social anthropology. Um, if you take an Anthropology 101 class in the UK, uh, you'll be told that the founding father of modern social anthropology is this man, Bronislav Malinowski. Late into his career, uh, Malinowski tried to synthesize his ideas into a coherent paradigm, uh, what he called functionalism, in a book that's called A Scientific Theory of Culture, published posthumously um, in 1944. In Malinowski's formulation, each culture constitutes a coherent whole which is designed to satisfy human needs in different ways, um, whether they're basic needs like food and shelter, or what he calls derived needs like religion, knowledge, law, uh, or pretty much anything that's not related to biological survival, in his view. Malinowski's functionalism influenced a later school of thought known as structural functionalism, um, whose main proponents were Alfred Reginald Radcliffe Brown, uh, Meyer Fortas, and E. E. Evans Pritchard, among others, um, and all of whom contributed to an edited volume that's considered a kind of classical illustration of structural functionalism that's called African Political Systems, which you can see here, uh, published in 1940. Structural functionalists contrasted culture with society. Right? Society, in their view, uh, was the concrete stuff of social organization. So it's the political, economic, and social institutions that make up a given social organism. Culture, on the other hand, um, was a set of immaterial rules and norms that allow the social organism to reproduce itself. These rules are there, but they're not directly observable. So structural functionalists uh, didn't tend to give them that much attention. Symbolic anthropology, on the other hand, argued against the marginalization of culture in structural functionalism uh, through scholars like David Schneider, Roy Wagner, Sherry Ortner, and, and Clifford Geertz, who you see here, and whose book, The Interpretation of Cultures, is on your further reading list. Um, all these scholars didn't all share the same conception of culture, um, but they shared two main assumptions about it. 
The first assumption is that culture is a mostly coherent whole made of different symbolic parts that constitute a web of meaning. Uh, and the anthropologist can reconstruct this whole culture, this whole web of meaning, by observing and interpreting its multiple parts. Um, so culture isn't just the glue that kind of serves society's needs or binds society together as in the functionalist and structural functionalist arguments, um, but it's a meaningful system that needs to be explained and interpreted on its own. The second assumption is that culture is like an open book waiting to be read by the right reader, uh, whether it's an initiated member of a particular culture who knows and applies uh, the codes of this culture skillfully, or whether it's an anthropologist who's initiated into the culture and learns to appreciate the meaning of every symbol within the whole um, web of meaning. This is what is called a textual approach to culture uh, by making an analogy between reading and writing on one hand and uh, interpreting cultural symbols on the other. These different schools in classical social anthropology contrast with the culture versus civilization debate that we've covered in one very important respect. The older definitions uh, considered culture with a capital C as one and universal, right? In a sense, there is just one culture for all of humanity, and we're all in different stages within this culture. And those who are seen as non-human or subhuman are considered culture-less. In classical social anthropology, there are many homogenous organized units that are called cultures, right, in the plural, um, each with their own responses to human needs or their own rules and norms or their own universe of meaning. So all human beings are thought to have a culture. It's not the same one everywhere. Right? This basic contrast is useful to bear in mind, um, although very few anthropologists today would identify as functionalists or structural functionalists, symbolic anthropologists. Um, because there were two major issues with these approaches overall. Um, first, none of these schools of thought uh, can account for historical change very well. Um, societies are either assumed to live in a perpetual state of equilibrium uh, or to have a bounded universe of meaning, and any social or cultural change uh, must eventually just come back to that equilibrium or to the existing system of meaning, right? Which is obviously historically inaccurate, um, especially if you think about the kind of political, economic, and social upheavals that happened all over the Middle East in the past 50 years, um, as you'll hear from Elizabeth next term. Right? And secondly, um, none of these schools uh, are very good at accounting for social conflict. Um, since all cultures are conceived as homogenous wholes where everyone knows their place and does their job so that society can just go about its daily business and reproduce itself, um, there's little to no thought given to class struggle or to women's liberation or to anti-colonial revolutions, um, all of which were ironically pressing issues at the very moment where these anthropologists were writing, roughly from the 1920s to the 1970s. Still, um, classical social anthropology has had a strong impact in Middle Eastern universities and cultural institutions more broadly since the 1940s. And this impact goes beyond just borrowing and adapting the ideas of European intellectuals like Malinowski or Radcliffe Brown or Geertz, um, but it responds to local concerns as well. Right? To give you just one example out of very many, I want to briefly mention the case of social anthropology in Iran, uh, which based on Fahnaz Najma uh, edited volume Conceptualizing Iranian Anthropology and Nematullah Fazili's uh, Politics of Culture in Iran, which aren't on your reading lists, but I can tell you more if you're interested. Um, Anthropology is a minor discipline in Iran, um, especially in comparison with archaeology, history, and sociology. Um, since the mid-20th century, there have been very few academic institutions devoted to anthropology in Iran, few staff and students in those institutions, few non-Iranian works of anthropology translated into Persian, um, and no overarching theoretical trend in all of Iranian anthropology. Still, um, between the 1940s and 1970s, Iranian anthropologists were predominantly involved in small-scale studies of rural groups in Iran, often nomadic groups or other minorities. And they gathered ethnographic data about these groups to assist with a broader social and political project, which were the top-down modernization reforms imposed by Mohammad Reza Shah um, and his regime. Now, this interest in uh, rural groups, small-scale groups, uh, very much reproduced the interest in studying small homogenous societies among the classical European and American anthropologists um, that you've seen earlier. Iranian anthropology equally reinforced the notion that cultures, quote unquote, were homogenous coherent units, um, even though the Iranian anthropologists didn't all share a single theory of how these units worked. And in some ways, it's similar to, you know, not all European and American anthropologists shared the same theory of how 
So this example shows you once again how ideas about society and culture can emerge in different ways in different contexts, um, even outside of Europe and uh, North America. Now onto the third approach, um, which we could call the culture industry approach. Um, the philosophers Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno coined this term in a book called The Dialectic of Enlightenment, um, which was initially published in 1944. The basic idea behind the term culture industry was well summed up in a chapter of the same name uh, in the book. Quote, culture today is infecting everything with sameness. Film, radio, and magazines form a system. Each branch of culture is unanimous within itself, and all are unanimous together. End quote. The idea is that all mass media, whether film, radio, television, magazines, songs, etc., form a big coherent system. And the purpose of the system is to produce repetitive content um, to infect everything with sameness um, as they write. The formulaic content of audiovisual media is designed to distract the masses, uh, both in the sense of providing cheap entertainment to the working classes, who are the kind of the main assumed target audience um, in their argument, which isn't actually the case for all mass media. Um, and uh, they're distracting in the sense of distracting the masses away from uh, their possible aspirations for a revolution, right? So just the argument is that if it weren't for YouTube and TikTok, uh, we'd all be out in the streets protesting. I mean, it's a bit reductive, but that's basically what they're trying to argue. Now, there are three main issues with Adorno and Horkheimer's argument. First, uh, they make the culture industry seem like a monolith, right? They assume that Film, radio, and magazines forms a coherent, coordinated system with predictable effects. Now, this assumption erases the concrete work of actual media workers, and it erases the concrete variations in the genres, aesthetics, and subjectivities produced within the cultural industries, plural. And the term is often pluralized in the scholarship today to talk about music industry, film industry, video game industry, and so on. Second, um, and this is, I think, the most problematic thing in my view, um, they assume that audiences are passive uh, and that their souls are thoroughly eaten by all the media products that they consume. Uh, this is empirically inaccurate, of course, because audiences never receive any media message passively uh, as if they're automatons, but they always filter it through their own local interpretations. And therefore, they actively participate in creating its meaning. Lastly, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer maintain an implicit distinction between uh, quote unquote highbrow and lowbrow culture and cultural genres. Um, this distinction reproduces a kind of upper class discourse where certain cultural forms are privileged over others uh, because one class deems it pleasing, right? This raises the question of how a specific highbrow culture emerges historically and also what intellectual justification we have for not examining lowbrow genres, you know, so why are opera and ballet deemed more valuable, let's say, as an object of study? than rap and hip-hop dancing, right? Now that's the broad gist of the argument. Adorno and Horkheimer's argument um, didn't have an immediate impact on the least intellectuals, largely because, I mean, their book was translated much, much later. Um, but some intellectuals in the region produced a very similar argument about culture industries and their impact on the so-called masses uh, right around the same time as Adorno and Horkheimer were writing. I'll give you just one example again in the interest of time. Um, this is a book called Safir Amerika Bil Alwan al or American Ambassador in Technicolor, um, by the Egyptian writer, director, and surrealist painter, uh, Kamil al Tirmiseni, which was first published in 1957. So the book basically argues against Hollywood's predominance in the Egyptian uh, domestic film market by claiming that Hollywood movies will homogenize the population's taste and will work against the interests of the newly independent Egyptian nation. I mean, uh, Egypt was formally independent in 1950. While El Tenmeseni didn't directly engage with Adorno and Horkheimer, um, he produced his own version of an argument where a dominant mass culture, which is Hollywood in this case, would take over the hearts and minds of the masses by being too seductive and too omnipresent to resist, right? which would have dangerous political consequences as well. In his view. Um, and this example illustrates once again how arguments about culture aren't just imported from Europe into the Middle East, but also can emerge in local intellectual discourse based on the local concerns of you know, the intellectuals living across um, the Middle East. Now, on to the fourth and final approach to culture for today, um, which is usually associated with uh, British cultural studies. Uh, 
Cultural studies began to consolidate as an academic field in the 1980s, um, especially at the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. Um, but the specific approach to culture that it adopted was elaborated in the writings of Richard Hogarth and Stuart Hall and Raymond Williams as early as the 1950s. Raymond Williams, in particular, uh, has written extensively on the concept of culture itself, um, including in well-known books such as Culture and Society or Culture and Materialism, which is on your further readings list, as well as a famous entry on culture in his book, uh, Keywords of Vocabulary of Culture and Society, which I very much recommend as an introduction to the key concepts in cultural studies. Um, Williams, as well as cultural studies scholars more broadly, acknowledge the long, complex, and sometimes contradictory history behind the notion of culture. Their approach overall has three distinguishing features in contrast with the previous approaches that we've covered today. First, cultural studies scholars assume that all culture is produced. Um, it's a concrete production by living and breathing human beings. And like all productions, uh, culture is subject to certain political, economic, and social conditions. Right? I just want to quickly point out that the notion of cultural production is central to another approach to culture that I won't have time to cover today, um, which is detailed in a book called The Field of Cultural Production by the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, in case you're interested in discussing it or reading more about it. But basically, the idea of cultural production is what sets the cultural industry and the cultural studies approach apart from the first two approaches that we've covered today, the you know, cultural civilization debate and the social anthropology. Uh, the first two approaches we've covered assume that culture is already out there, right? either because it's an established knowledge that's necessary for the individual self-cultivation, or because it's an objective social organism that the anthropologist can study from the outside. Right? In both cases, culture already exists, um, and it's not understood as the outcome of a production process, as it is in the latter two approaches. Second, Cultural studies isn't just interested in how a certain culture is produced, but also how it is received, consumed, and interpreted by people living in it. This is what marks the main difference between the culture industry approach and the cultural studies one. Um, while culture industry scholars don't pay much attention to media reception, um, because they assume that the masses will just gobble up whatever is said on radio or television, um, Cultural studies scholars assume that people always have the ability to assess and interpret cultural products in different ways according to their local worldviews. Third, and most importantly, uh, cultural studies is interested in how culture itself is a contested category, right? and how struggles over what culture means and what culture does are simultaneously struggles over state power and class formation. In Adorno and Horkheimer's argument, um, the struggle has already known parameters before the analysis, right? There's a ruling elite that wants to distract the masses and a working class that consumes mass media products. And the struggle is on whether the ruling class can remain in power or whether a uh, revolution will upset them, right? The actors in the struggle and the grounds of the struggle itself are already clear and set in stone before we enter the analysis. Cultural studies, uh, on the other hand, tends to dispute this assumption by arguing that the parameters of the struggle are set in the course of the struggle itself, right? So it's only when living and breathing human beings uh, contest and debate what culture means and what culture does that a line is drawn between different classes or between the state and the people or between an imperial power and its colonies. Um, and these lines uh, keep shifting historically as the struggle goes on between these different and this is an argument you'll find in different versions uh, across the cultural studies literature. Um, this overall approach to culture, I think, has been quite influential in Arab cultural studies, um, including in Tarek Sabri's, uh, Joe Khalil's, and Walter Armbrust's writings, which are all uh, your key readings for this week. Right? Um, so this gives you kind of a background about what assumptions all these key readings are making about culture when they're writing. Since the early 2000s, um, roughly, cultural studies has also become a small but growing academic field in Arabic-speaking countries and in Turkey as well, um, in dialogue with European traditions of cultural studies that I've mentioned, uh, but also with local specificities. And this is really the approach that's closest to what I do in my own research and uh, in my lectures this term. I, I tend to approach culture as a contested category, which changes through conflict between actors and institutions over time. And this approach has some limitations as well, I think it does, um, which I'll be happy to discuss with you in our seminar this week and get your ideas about these limitations. Um, but for now, I just wanted to give you that kind of 
broader background uh, before we go into our discussion. So, to summarize, um, I have covered four approaches to culture today. The first one equated culture either with civilization directly or with a process of self-cultivation as part of a larger progression towards civilization. The second one considered culture as a coherent and homogeneous whole covering distinct societies. Um, and this whole is conceived either as an organism designed to satisfy human needs or as the rules and norms binding society or as a shared universe of meaning, but there's still this idea of a coherent whole that is distinct according to different things. The third uh, approach considered culture as an industrial production designed to distract the masses. And the fourth one considered culture as a productive human activity emerging through concrete struggles over state power and class formation. And this last approach, as I've mentioned, is closest to the way in which we'll approach uh, culture and cultural production in the following lectures, whether we're talking about heritage or about film, television, music, uh, or social media even uh, in uh, week six. All these ideas are tied up into the concept of culture, uh, as it was elaborated by scholars from different parts of the world at different times. Right? And I hope to have shown in particular how approaches to culture aren't just mechanically borrowed from European theorists and applied in Middle Eastern settings, but they're also theorized in their own right by intellectuals across the region. And in short, I think it's important to bear in mind all this context uh, when you encounter the concept of culture in your readings. Um, so don't just assume that the word culture means one thing or the other, because it can mean many things depending on the context. And that will be all for today.